Father in heaven, we thank you for your love and your grace and your kindness and your mercy. We pray today, Lord, that we will have ears that hear, but more than that, that conviction will come to our hearts that will lead to action. We need to move into action now. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we've been doing this Heart to Heart series since the beginning of the year. We're focused on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and, and uh, we have cool graphics and all kinds of stuff. But it's more than that. And it's been kind of fun so far, and, and we've even had a fun little game we worked on. And remember what I told you, whenever you come into the sanctuary, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to look around, and what are you supposed to say? These are the people I love. That's right. So when you come into the sanctuary and you look around, these are the people I love. And it's been kind of fun. So you just do it just for a second. Look around you. Look around real quick. Take a look. Okay. Feels good right now. And let's say it together. These are the people I love. All right. So that's the easy part. Today it gets real. Or at least it starts getting real. But let, let's go back for a second and review our context. So 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Now, let me just clarify a certain point here because I had a question from somebody on this, and I want to make sure everybody understands this. When this is saying, if I have this stuff but I don't have love, it's not saying, if I'm doing all these things but nobody's really nice to me, then it's not fun. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is, even if I have these amazing gifts, if I'm not using them from a basis of love, then those gifts will not have the eternal impact God wants them to have. It's not about whether people love you. It's about whether you are acting out of love when you use your gifts. So let's just make sure we're clear on that. So we need to love. But now, as Lou Graham would say, I want to know what love is. What say you, Paul? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Now we're going to be spending today and next Sabbath on these four verses. This week, we're going to talk about what love is. Next Sabbath, we'll talk about what love is not. So specifically today, we're we're just going to use certain sections here of these four verses. We're going to use the first part of verse 4 and all of verse 7. So for today, this is our passage. Love is patient. Love is kind. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes always perseveres. These are the things that Paul says love is. And as we talk about them today, you will see why the easy part of this series is over and why the real work begins today. Because in order to honestly say these are the people I love, you're going to have to be ready to make an honest effort to actually love the people you say you love. Today is about words and about the meaning of words, but more than that, about what these words mean to our lives and what changes we need to make in our lives in order for these words to be true. 
Now, you've been reading 1 Corinthians 13 for the past several weeks, and likely by now you've read it in different translations, which is always a good idea to do unless you're trying to memorize it. Then you just get confused. So if you're memorizing, just stick with the one. But, but it's a good idea to read different translations. And if, in fact, you've been doing that, you've probably noticed that not all translations have the exact same words for what love is in this context. Now, I'll give you a couple examples. So one of the most obvious is the King James Version, for some reason, decided to translate the word love in 1 Corinthians 13 as charity. Now, it's kind of an unusual choice because pretty much everywhere else that word agape appears, the King James says love. But in this one, it says charity. Pretty much every other translation will say love. Another example here, love is patient. The King James, again, went another way with it. It said, love suffereth long. Now, there's actually something interesting that the King James is getting at there, and we'll talk about that in a second. But there's another one. It's not always the King James that's, that's different than the others. Uh, for example, the King James and the New American Standard, New Revised Standard, says love bears all things. The NIV says love always protects. So we'll talk about this as we go along here. But you ever wonder why the translations sometimes read a little differently? Well, here's the simple explanation. The New Testament was not written in English. And if you know anything at all about languages, you know that there is no such thing as a literal word-for-word exact translation. Why? Because words have zones of meaning. And sometimes those zones overlap each other, and often when you're translating, there is no exact word that replaces another exact word. Now, let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about here about zones of meaning. So let's say there's something you need to get done, and I am involved in whether or not you can get it done. Now, there's a number of words we could use to describe what it would take for that to happen. So, for example, I can enable you to get it done or I can empower you to get it done, or I can allow you to get it done, or I can permit you to get it done. You see how each one of those words has a slightly different meaning, yet there's kind of overlap sometimes, isn't there, between enable and empower, or between allow and permit. This is what happens in translations. Today we're going to focus on what love is, and to do that we will profit greatly from considering each of the words that Paul uses to describe what love is. And we're going to do some rudimentary Greek today because that's about all I'm able to do. I'm not that good at it. But I think it'll be kind of fun. So here we go. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Or, if you prefer... Hey agape, macrothumai, kreistuatai, hey agape, ponta stegai, ponta pistuai, ponta elpizai, ponta hupomenai. Now, maybe some of those words sounded a little familiar to you, although my accent I don't think is perfect. But maybe they sounded familiar. For example, agape, right? We kind of know that one, the, the word for love, the New Testament word for, old, for unselfish love. Now, the Greeks had a lot more words for love than we have in English. And so they could actually, in the concept of love, uh, be more subtle with the word picture they were painting than we can with English. But then that's probably not too surprising because English comes from Northern Europeans, and and let's be honest, we're we're frankly not known for subtlety in love sometimes, are we? There There was a reason the Romans called us barbarians, I think. So that's where English comes from. So love's gonna have to be enough for us. But let's dive in here. Love is patient. Hey, agape macrothumai. All right, now I want you to understand this Greek word here because that, that hey, that's actually like uh, the word the. So what you have is the love and macrothumai means is patient. Now if you were here 
Three and a half years ago, during the fall of 2014, you might just remember this particular word because we encountered macrothumai, or more accurately, another form, macrothumia, in a different list we were looking at, the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, that's the place it was. This is the same word we find in 1 Corinthians 13, or at least a form of it. Macrothumia means patience. Macrothumai means patient. You see the difference in those words. It's a compound word. Macro, we still use that today to describe something large. Well, in its original context, macro meant a long ways from. And then the second word, thumos, is the root. It meant hot. But now you know how words sometimes over time take on a grammatical meaning that goes beyond their original meaning. It came to mean hot as in being angry. So macrothumia meant being a long ways from angry. It's kind of like the opposite of being on edge. And that's what love is described as being. Love does not grit its teeth and endure the other person. I love you, (laughs) so I'm going to put up with this. And at the end of the day, you're going to praise me for not losing it. That's not it. That's not macrothumai. That's not patient. Love is patient. And in this sense, the King James Version captures an important point. It says... Love suffers long. Now, for this to work, love has got to be interested not just in what's good for itself. Love has to be interested in what's good for the other. There's an example for what this kind of patience looks like. It's Paul writing to Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Remember, we reflected on this some time ago, this idea of Paul calling himself a bad sinner. But you actually go back to the early days of Paul, and he was a pretty bad guy, wasn't he? He was responsible for the death of Christians. Verse 16, but for that very reason I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense, what's the word? Patience, macrothumia. That through me, Christ might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. So what does this mean? It means that to truly be able to say, these are the people I love, we have to be willing to seek to be as patient with each other as Jesus has been with us. That's a bit of a high standard, isn't it? Has Jesus been patient with you? See, it isn't enough for me to just keep from blowing up at you this time. We need to approach our relationships with each other from a completely different perspective. Tolerance is not enough. We need to love each other even before transformation has made the other one acceptable to our preference, or dare we even say we need to love the other one before transformation has made them acceptable to our need. Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So I told you it was going to get a little tight today, but we've already spent too long on this particular word, and there's several more, so we've got to move on. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is kind. Christ do a tie, hey agape. All right, so you see the hey agape again, that's the love. Christ means is kind. 
But now this is kind of an interesting word because this exact form of the word only occurs in this one spot in all the New Testament. However, there's several occurrences of the root word from which it comes. The very specific word is technically to be kind. But to help us understand what kind of kind we're talking about here, let me read you a couple passages where the root word for this is used. And the first one is attributed to Jesus, Matthew 11, verse 28. You know this one. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. Now, the interesting point here is that word easy is actually Christos, the root word for kind and my burden is light. So what Jesus is saying here is my yoke that I'm going to put on you is kind. Let me ask you this question. How often is the yoke we hang on other people kind? Or how often is it severe? See, Jesus gives us a yoke of kindness. Jesus shows His love by only placing on us a yoke that is easy or kind. And the same kindness that Jesus shows to us is the kindness we're supposed to show to each other. It has to do with our expectations. I'm only going to be nice to you if you meet what I want you to meet. Now, that's not it. All right, so, so we're supposed to be kind, but who are we supposed to be Christos to? Luke 6, verse 35, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back, then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind, that's Christos, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Who are you supposed to be kind to? Your enemies, the ungrateful, the wicked. See, love shows the same kindness, the same Christos to its enemies as the Most High shows to us. Romans 2, verse 4, Or do you show contempt for the riches of His kindness, that's another form of the word, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness, God's Christon, another form of the word, is intended to lead you to repentance. The reason we show kindness to each other is because the purpose is to lead us into relationship. You ever heard a soft answer turns away wrath? That's kindness. And truly, the kind of kindness that we're talking about is divine in nature. Ephesians 4, 32 be kind, be Christoi, that's another form of the word, and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. What's the standard? Just as in Christ, God forgave you. That's the standard. This is the kindness that love demands. And you might at this point be thinking, no more, stop already, but I'm sorry. I can't stop. I won't stop because there are four more words you need to know about what love is. We'll try to move through them quickly. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 7. Ponta stegai, ponta pistui, ponta ellipsa, el, uh, you know, I can't do it. El pizzai, ponta hupomenai. Or if you prefer, love always protects always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So let's look at those quickly. Protects or bears all things. This is the word stegai. This is actually kind of an interesting word because it's one of those that developed a grammatical meaning over time, and it was an extrapolation from its original meaning. The original meaning apparently was to cover something closely so that water stays out. I guess to have a word that specific, you have to be a maritime people. So I guess the Greeks were, so that works. But they had a word that said to cover something so that water stays out. But apparently, 
if you covered something for that, it was something that was durable. It was something that was rigid, that stayed in place even while the ship tossed and turned. And so grammatically, this word changed from narrowly that to being to bear up under. So presumably, something that was stegai was perceived to be durable, and that must have led to the expanded meaning that it got. And now, so this is the, the etymology, and it's interesting, but, but don't get caught there. What matters is that we figure out what this is telling us. It's not a word that's used regularly, but it's a word that gets at how much we really need to be willing to suffer to love. And we get an example of this word in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is Paul. He said, If others have this right of support for you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything, that's ponta stegomen, rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. So what Paul is saying to them here is, we didn't demand you give us money because we didn't want to harm the spreading of the gospel. Therefore, we put up with all your foolishness in order to teach you the gospel. That's what love does. In other words, the list of things that love will not endure is, based on Paul's use of this word, pretty short. And that's the point, if you're willing to accept it. But let's go to the next word. Always trust. Ponta pistuai. Now, this is actually a very common word in its various form. It can mean belief or faith or trust in. And in our context, these are the people I love. It means, to stay with an 80s theme here, to borrow from Perry and Cain and Schoen, don't stop believing. Hold on to that feeling. That's literally what it means. It means when it comes to our brothers and sisters in the faith, we never give up believing that no matter what's going on right now, we can abide together in peace and harmony and love. It means we don't stop believing in the vision that God can make us one in Jesus Christ. A good text to give us a feel for the scope of of this word is in Romans, Romans 4, verse 5. However, to the one who does not work but trusts, that's a form of this word, trust God who justifies the ungodly, their faith, again, that's the same word, is credited as righteousness. So we hang on. Even though we ourselves continue to fail, we hang on believing that God is able to justify us in the same way in our relationships. We believe that God can make us one. All right, two more. Always hopes. Ponta el pizzai. A text that captures this notion best is Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 22. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, that's el pidi, that's the same word, we were saved. But hope, el pis, that is seen, is no hope at all. Who hopes, el pisai, that's, that's the word we have, for what they already have. Who hopes for what they already have? But we hope for what we do not yet have. We wait for it patiently. So what it's saying is this. As it applies to love, maybe we don't have that relationship right now, but I never lose hope that we will because love keeps believing that we will. Love keeps hoping that it's going to come true one day. Maybe it isn't true in fullness. When you look around you right now, and maybe don't look around right now because this could be uncomfortable. Maybe it isn't true. When you look around you right now, these are the people I love. Maybe that doesn't feel true. But hope says one day it can be. And there's another word here in verse 25. 
a word that maybe you remember from another fall series, this one five and a half years ago, a series entitled The Three Angels. It's a word we've drug out every now and then. It says at the end of verse 25, but if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Now, this isn't the same patient word that we saw back at the beginning where it said love is patient. No, this is the same word that shows up in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. This one has to do with our endurance. So, according to Romans, hope waits with patient endurance. And what was that word? It was hupomone. You remember that one? Hupomone. Perseverance. Love perseveres. That's actually the next word that comes up here. Agape panta hupomenai. Love always perseveres. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love Him. Love hangs on until the promise is fulfilled. So that's what love looks like. This is what it looks like to live out the saying, these are the people I love. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, love is patient, love is kind. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. All right, so you see that list there. Some of those you're probably pretty good at. Some of those probably pretty hard. But here's what Jesus said. John 13, verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So now you know what love is. Next week, I'll tell you what love is not. But for now, we need to get back to the homework. You know, there have been two things so far, and I'm going to add a third today. Number one, read 1 Corinthians 13 every day. Keep going over it. You need to get this in your mind. Second, whenever you come into this place and as you go out, look around you, make a point to look around you and say, these are the people I love. But here's the third, and this is for this week. I want you, when you're reflecting on 1 Corinthians 13, to especially notice verses 4 through 7. And since this is love is today, I want you to notice the parts about what love is. Love is kind. Love is patient. All the things that love always does. And I want you, as you reflect on those things, to ask God, which of these am I doing the way you want me to? And which of these do I need help with? And which relationships do I need to apply these to? That's a challenge. But you know what? If all we do is talk about this, it's not going to make any difference at all, right? If we don't go home and figure out how to apply these in our life. So that's item three. Focus on verses four to seven. And prayerfully ask God to show you which am I doing the way you want and which am I not. Why are we doing it? It's simple, really. A church that truly loves will be identified as disciples of Jesus and will be empowered to change the world. So Paul has told us what love is. May God help us to live it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, by your grace and mercy, continue to show us what love is so that we can walk in this place and say with a clear conscience, because of what we're doing, 
that these are the people I love. These are the people I'm patient with and kind to. And that I always hope and persevere for. Lord, make these things true in our lives. Our desire is to be identifiable as your disciples. And you've told us that people will know that when we love one another. Put that love in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.